this week on the Back Table Podcast. Yeah, we're trying, to get, we're trying to get the learn meeting back um, oh, nice. in in this this fall, maybe in October. That you know, stay stay tuned for that. That's probably um, something as part of the PAD service line we're we're working on getting back. It looks like it's going to happen. Cool. Um, that's that's aimed towards early career stuff. Um, sorry, Omar, I didn't mean to step on you. Yeah, and, yeah, and, and Mike, I want to say Twitter is a great resource, you know, for PAD. I think. <laughs> it honestly yeah. is. Yeah, I think so. So, yeah, just join Twitter, you know. <laughs> Learn, learn. From all these <laughs> follow, uh, follow, Kum- follow, Kumar. Yeah, Kumar. Yeah, yeah Kumar. Yeah. <laughs> all right, everybody. Welcome to the Backtable podcast. Backtable is a resource created by IRs for IRs to connect with your colleagues and learn tips, techniques, and the ins and outs of the devices in your cabinets. Download our free iTunes app to access all previous episodes of our podcasts, our blog posts, and procedure-specific content to help you grow your practice. This is Aaron Fritz uh, filling in as your host. Today, we're going to tackle a hot topic in our specialty, uh, the OBL, or outpatient-based lab, which is a practice model we're seeing with increasing frequency, and also a follow-up to the last podcast we did with Mary Constantino on um, uterine fibroid embolization in the OBL. Today, we're going to be specifically talking more about PAD in the OBL. So I'm joined today by Dr. Omar Saleh out of Los Angeles, and Dr. Mike Watts out of Philadelphia. Welcome. Thank you both for joining me. Oh, thank you. Hey, thanks. Yeah, thanks um, for having me. So I'd like to start out with just having you guys each share your story about how you ended up in the outpatient-based lab, um, maybe a little bit briefly, you know, how, how your practice started out of training and then how you transitioned to the OBL and, how, you know, what your experience has been like compared to a, the previous hospital-based practice. Um, so let's go ahead and start with you, Mike. Tell me a little bit, you know, about your past. Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, before I uh, joined the outpatient world, I was uh, I was an attending at Penn for four years, um, and uh, you know, I had a uh, part of my responsibilities there as I was directing IR for the Philadelphia VA. So I'd spend three days a week at the VA and, and two at Penn, and um, was able to use some of the training that I got in uh, peripheral arterial disease at Penn from, from Tim Clark, um, which was, you know, few and far between because, you know, in 2011, it wasn't really, uh, abundantly done in IR. Um, and I think we were probably right about average where there were a few cases here and there, but not a whole lot. So when I went to the VA, I took some of that experience, um, and showed some cases to the podiatrist there and showed some cases to the vascular surgeons who weren't doing a lot and, uh, just kind of got the response. Hey, this is great. We're really glad you want to try it. We have a lot of patients for you. Uh, and little by little, they started sending patients to me. Um, and just, you know, learning as we went, uh, had some decent outcomes, uh, were able to provide good service, um, you know, kind of same day, next day service, and really built a practice up. So I did that for four years, started doing maybe 15 or 20 cases my first year up to well over 100 my last two years. Um, and really kind of taking all comers, doing a lot of CLI um, and then claudicants and stuff that, you know, the VA patients who have had claudication for you know, 20 or 30 years without, you know, really any relief. So um, I took that and um, after a while, uh, I was approached basically by uh, a guy who owned his own outpatient centers uh, in Philadelphia, the surrounding area. So we had three uh, three centers, two of them were ASCs, one of them was an OBL, and uh, asked if I would join them. So I figured I was really enjoying uh, kind of the the PAD and CLI experience that I was having, and this was an opportunity to practice full time. Uh, and then, you know, there are a lot of frustrations working in a big academic center and working in a VA. And when the two of them are combined, you know, they, they, they kind of multiply. So in 2016, I left to go full-time outpatient and, uh, that's all I've done for the past three years. I mean, it's 95% peripheral arterial disease. The majority of it is CLI, uh, and then a little bit of, uh, vein, vein practice for patients with non-healing ulcers and, um, you know, minimal dialysis, but, uh, that's about it. I mean, probably over the three years averaging 600 or so, uh, peripheral arterial cases per year. And that's, uh, you know, obviously quite a bit different than working from, you know, in the, in the hospital, uh, um, to the outpatient setting. I mean, there, it's just night and day. 
Uh, yeah. So we can get into a, a lot more of that. Yeah. And real quick, we, before we get to Omar, um, do you, Mike, do you have hospital privileges somewhere? Or like, do you still do some cases in the hospital? Excellent question. So um, I resigned all of my hospital privileges when I left in 2016, and I went for about a year or a year and a half without any hospital privileges. Um, the Some of the larger uh, health insurance providers mandated that if I were to be credentialed with them, I would need hospital privileges. So uh, I was... I had applied to probably about a dozen hospitals uh, for privileges uh, all around the area. I mean, within a 50 mile radius and the majority of them, uh, whether I had an in, 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 in kind of with the podiatrist, with a wound care center, people who had referred to me, people who knew my work, they would get us try to try to get me in. Uh, and a lot of times the administration would be really excited. And then when it came down to the fact that I was a radiologist and they had a radiology exclusive contract, I was, you know, kind of dead on arrival. So that failed a number of times. Um, and you know, we've all kind of heard it talked about in SIR connect and other places, but, um, it, it really was a, a hardship for me basically to, to find hospital privileges. Uh, I was able to, um, right after being out for about a year and a half, um, kind of form a relationship with a, a group of hospitals that were looking for an IR to help take call, uh, an older group of IR guys who, you know, just basically had aged out of taking call and needed someone to cover their three hospitals. So I signed a contract with them where I would cover eight weeks of call and I would work five days during the year. And then I would have full admitting privileges at their hospitals. So that opened up a lot of things, uh, as far as, insurance credentialing, um, but also did give me a place where I could bring patients uh, if I needed to. I've probably done that maybe eight times or so in the last, in the, in the last year um, okay. instead of doing an outpatient. You know, I, I, I wasn't, when I left, uh, you know, the academic world to go outpatient, I mean, everybody's like, oh, you're going to work, uh, you know, just Monday through Friday, no call, no weekends. And right. that was great for a while, but it, it I'm not sure that that's you know, it, it, it may right. be realistic. It may be it may be realistic in some settings, but yeah, I think um, not not always. I agree with you. There's something that doesn't feel right about it. You know? <laughs> You're absolutely right, <laughs> uh, Omar. Sorry to ignore you there, man. Let's, yeah, yeah, no uh, problem. Yeah, let's let's hear what you, let's hear where you came yeah. from. So, um, you know, I I graduated from fellowship uh, back in 2013. So I've been out for about five years, and I think the the first four years. Worked at uh, two hospital jobs. So I think the first job, you know, I joined and it was like a, a IR group that wasn't very aggressive. And I was like super gung ho. And, you know, I joined them and they, you know, they didn't, they were doing zero PAD, zero aortic, you know, interventions, zero dialysis stuff. I mean, it was like a really weak practice. And in like two years, you know, we were doing PAD and aortic interventions and all this stuff. So I was really excited. But what was killing me was, my group was uh, tying me to RVUs, you know, and you really couldn't be valued as an IR when uh, you could, you know, say you do an atherectomy case, the hospital is making most of those, you know, fees that the group doesn't take much. So the group doesn't value as much as, you know, someone sitting in that hour reading, you know, a bunch of CT scans or MRIs, right? Yeah. So it was hard to have negotiating power. I mean, you know, like a lot of, and I feel like a lot of young IRs are going through that where their group doesn't support them, you know, for clinic or for doing these long cases and things like that. So, um, you know, I left that group and I joined another group that was making me promises of, you know, the same type of stuff like, oh yeah, develop our practice. And when I joined that group, I mean, the vascular surgeons in that hospital were sending us all types of like, PAD and everything. I mean, there was no turf wars or anything, but it was my own group that was like stopping me from doing PAD. They were like, the nurses were controlling the schedule and putting like nephrostomy tube exchanges and stuff. You know, it was like ridiculous. So, and you know, that only lasted like five months. So I was like, okay, screw this. I just quit and joined a night job. (laughs) So that's what I did. And, um, I joined, uh, so you guys know Sabine, he, he works out of LA. Um, he's in a really good, uh, group. They're a really strong IR group and a really good diagnostic group and they support each other. So I basically joined their uh, group just as a night radiologist, but I have IR privileges there. 
and um, I have all this time off. So I work one week on, two weeks off. And in the two weeks off, I've got, you know, other contracts uh, with OBLs and I do PAD and dialysis work in these OBLs. Um, but I mean, for me, um, I'm not like full time doing the OBL stuff. Uh, I kind of like the time off right now. I have little kids and I just like being off. So that's kind of what I'm doing right now. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I have like contracts with two OBLs. There is, uh, I can probably buy into one of them, you know, and be a partner. Yeah. Um, but I just haven't gotten around to it yet. But I mean, I have that option to buy in and kind of transition into it full time if I wanted to. But right now I'm just, you know, kind of taking it easy and just, yeah. you know, enjoying uh, life, enjoying <laughs> life. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, um, with, with, with what you're doing, uh, during the day with the OBLs, are, are you having to bring patients in yourself or are these patients that are, I've already, they're, they're, they're kind of brought to you already. Are you having to market um, for yourself? No, I haven't. I really haven't had to market. So it's been really, uh, I, I did a little bit of marketing, but, um, I'll kind of I'll kind of tell you like uh, what happened with these OBLs. These are like uh, big nephrology groups in the LA area. Okay, okay. and so like one uh, OBL that I work at, I, I I don't go there much. I just go there for the PAD. But they have uh, I think they have like fifteen thousand patients and five thousand dialysis patients. So they have so many patients, and I think you know um, a lot of them are getting their PAD work done by in the hospitals by you know whatever specialist. And this other group I have probably has about 2,000 to 5,000 patients. So they have a lot of patients too. So we're, we're basically uh, seeing them. Uh, I, so I do a lot more dialysis work, I think, than Mike does. Yeah. But um, a lot of those dialysis things turn into PAD because a lot of these dialysis patients um, have like non-healing wounds and claudication yeah. and rest pain. So, I mean, when I see a tunnel dialysis catheter removal, I check their feet. <laughs> you know, I do. I mean, I do. I check everybody. I check with them. I mean, and if they have a, you know, non-healing wound or a lot of pain, you know, we work them up and uh, we get the necessary tests and, you know, things like that. And then we get cases that way. And then um, I actually did uh, go out and give talks to like these big HMOs in the area and showed them some of our cases that we're doing in the OBL. And I showed them how we can do them safely. You know, we're doing some pretty, you know, like uh, long, you know, I mean, we're, I kind of showed them like things that are being done in our OBL that aren't being done in some of these smaller hospitals in the area, you know, yeah. like total revascularization. So, um, when I told, when I, you show them that you wouldn't show these big HMOs that you can do these safely, they're going to send them to the OBL because it's a lot cheaper than going to the hospital. So that's another way I've been getting referrals. Uh, okay. and that's kind of also a work in progress. And so do you still take, like if you have a really complicated case or it's a, a patient who's sicker than you want to handle in the OBL, are you taking them to PIH to do them during the day or, or do you yeah. have to take them? Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, either I'll do it or I'll, you know, I have such great IR colleagues that I'll just refer to them and they'll do it. Yeah. You know, just because I mean, yeah. yeah, I mean, either way, whoever Send can it to it Sabine after. or something like that. Yeah. Right. Right. I mean, yeah. And I've done that a couple of times or if it's, uh, yeah, I mean, or if it's like some aortic intervention or something i would probably send it to pih or some hospital i, I have hospital privileges in other areas too i yeah. take call uh you know so my that first job that i left i kind of you know still take call for them okay and it was a pretty pretty big group so i have privileges in like uh five or six hospitals in the area so oh, i mean wow. i, could, I yeah. could do i could do interventions there it's just not worth it for me uh yeah. i'd rather just be in the obl you know yeah, yeah. more profitable just to do it in the obl and then to send it out to somebody <laughs> You know, uh, for um, me, because I, I trust my partner. So I, I usually send it to Sabine or somebody. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a great setup. Um, yeah. I wanted to ask you guys and uh, Mike, I want to ask you about yeah. your workup for a PD patient. I know right. you get, it sounds like you get a lot of patients come over from podiatry. Yep. Um, but what if it's just like a, a family practice doc who's got a patient with leg pain and they don't know what to do with the patient and, you know, they send you over for a consult to sort of walk us through like how you approach that patient. Sure. So, um, yeah, I have a, a, a kind of much different you know, practice model because we are kind of uh, marketing ourselves. Um, uh, but Omar does have a great setup because I actually had a guy who I treated like eight times over the course of three years. And actually, actually I booted him to Sabine. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the guy's like, I'm moving to California to be my family. I was like, where in California? I said Los Angeles. Like, I got the guy for I got a guy. <laughs> I, got the guy. <laughs> I washed my hands of that guy. Um, anyway, uh, so that's a great question. I guess if you if you kind of 
let's step back a little bit and talk about our model a little bit more. So we have three centers um, geographically distant. I mean, they're kind of like a hundred mile radius. Um, and, you know, the, the way we work and, and because when you're doing these procedures in an outpatient setting, they do reimburse quite well. So, I mean, the, the goal I think for us is a little bit more like, you know, spend money to make money kind of thing. So we all have, um, each center has, um, a marketer, um, you know, bid will go out, uh, pound the pavement, uh, do cold calls, do educational sessions. Um, and then when they find somebody who's interested or a group, uh, they'll bring us in for a lunch or for a dinner um, and then, or for a talk at some, some group, um, you know, a, a local podiatry group or, uh, you know, a home care agency or, um, you know, just kind of go around and, and, and do kind of all of that relationship building and re- relationship maintaining, make sure that, you know, one, when a patient gets sent to us that the, they, they'll hand deliver the, uh, the, the consult note or the procedure note the next day, um, just make sure everything's okay. So, you know, we do have some, uh, physician liaison type people who, who are the intermediaries. So if there is a family practice group who's interested and we, we have a number of them, uh, and they have their high volume and they're going to send us patients, you know, there's, there's a couple ways to do it. Um, one way that's been really successful for us is to actually send uh, a medical assistant and in, in one or two cases, uh, an ultrasound tech um, and actually spend, you know, a half day or a day a week in that office mm-hmm. with either a physician or a nurse practitioner. Um, so, you know, it's, it's resource intensive, uh, yeah. but it's well worth it because what they'll do is, you know, there'll be three or four docs in the, in the uh, practice and the, they'll, screen their patients or have a, you know, one of their MAs or nurse practitioners screen a patient and say, all right, it looks like, you know, you have some sort of vascular issue going on. We have our vascular guy here next Thursday. You know, I'd love you to go see him. So we have, uh, you know, basically the ability to do ABI, PVR, uh, ultrasound, venous arterial, and a little exam room. Um, So, you know, it's, it's again, kind of our outreach person's responsibility to work with that office and say, all right, we have that day packed. We have, you know, 15 patients that you're going to see. Yeah. Um, and then we, we just go for it. And we, we don't expect that those guys know anything about peripheral arterial disease versus peripheral venous disease versus anything. Yeah. Um, you know, we get patients, you know, just the general, my legs are, or my legs are swollen um, or, you know, to the, to the point where sometimes it's like a 32 year old woman who's, uh, just been diagnosed with high cholesterol. And so, like, well, you know, go get checked out. Right. Um, so, but a lot of them, I mean, are, are patients who have, you know, non-healing ulcers that they've had for 20 years, <laughs> you know, they, they're like, well, I don't, it's always just been there. Um, oh, does it hurt when you walk? Yeah. I can't walk from me to you. Um, so, you know, there's, that's a, a much more kind of full spectrum, uh, patient, disease, uh, kind of process where you never know what you're going to get. Yeah. But then again, we can, we have setups where we can say, we can do a procedure on someone and say, all right, I'm going to, um, see you in a month at that office where, you know, you live right around the corner uh, and we're going to do a follow-up ultrasound and I'll check you and we'll talk to you at that point. Right. So having these little satellite offices set up, um, is really, uh, helpful. And, and, you know, one of the ways to do it, that's beneficial for the practice you're working with is you, you give them a fair market value rental. So, you know, we're going to use this exam room, this conference consult room and, you know, the fair market value for this amount of square footage and this zip code is X. Um, and then, you know, we'll give you a couple hundred dollars a week or whatever when we're there. Um, mm-hmm. and it works out for everybody. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so the, but, you know, kind of, the, as you, I guess your original question was, how's the, how does the consult work? Um, that's, that's generally, yeah, I like to meet someone, um, kind of get an understanding of what their complaints are, just do a, a quick assessment of what I think is most likely to be the issue. And then a lot of times, you know, I'll say, well, I think this is probably venous pathology based on the fact that your legs look exactly like this is venous pathology, but I don't expect the family doctors to know that. Um, I'll do a quick ABI and then I'll do a venous ultrasound, mm-hmm. um, <clears throat> or, you know, the other way around, you know, this is, you have an arterial wound, you know, you have classic claudication, you have ischemic rest pain in your foot. Let me do a quick ABI and then say, you know, can you come tomorrow for a procedure? Um, sometimes bypassing that ultrasound. Um, yeah. but you know, the, all the, all the options are on the table for us, which I think, 
uh, is really extremely helpful. All of our centers are, are um, vascular labs with ultrasound techs. Um, so it's, it's a real full service um, process. Sort of, and so once you get somebody who comes in and you've you've determined that they let's say they have arterial disease, and um, you know whether it be by the ABI or you know you do you you do an ultrasound and they've got you see that they've got significant arterial disease. Um, where do you go from there? Do you go straight to the lab? Do you go uh, and do some sort of CTA or MRA to see if they have any inflow disease? <clears throat> no, so um, I, I don't think I've probably ever in this, uh, um, practice, uh, order a CTA or an MRA. Um, you know, it's basically, we're going to be doing a diagnostic, uh, you know, arteriogram basically before we do any intervention. So, you know, yeah. based on the PVRs, you know, we kind of know whether there's going to be, you know, really terrible inflow disease. Gotcha. Um, if not, I, 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 you know, when we, when you see, uh, you know, a lot of these cases on Twitter and people showing all these awesome cases and they're sticking anagrade and they're going down and doing all these pedal loops and plan, you know, planning what they're doing. Um, you know, we don't often have that uh, anatomic level of, of uh, preview, I guess. So we'll, we'll do contralateral uh, retrograde stick up and over uh, so we can do a good uh, aortogram and run off both sides um, and then, you know, kind of plan the, you know, what, if anything needs to be done in the less symptomatic side and, and go to the, treat the symptomatic side. Uh, and, you know, we very rarely, you know, have any issue with that. Um, you know, the, the, all the ON4 wires and balloons are long enough. Uh, the devices tend to be long enough. That's not really an issue. You know, there are some times when, when the bifurcation is, is really uh, tortuous and calcified, you lose some pushability, but, you know, there's nothing uh, that says we can't, you know, either, come up from the other side from the foot or, or, or do another stick and a grade. Um, so it, I don't think it, it costs us much, uh, as far as not having that anatomic imaging beforehand. Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, it, it's again, since we're not hospital affiliated, you know, it's a little bit difficult to say, all right, I want you to take the script and go to, you know, X hospital and then come back for, you know, come back right. and, and bring me the images because it's, it's just a, another way to, to lose somebody. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and not really not saying no, selfishly, I'm going to lose these patients, but you know, they may not get treated. Um, you know, it's just another way to fall through the cracks. Right. Right. So, so, you, um, and like, if it's something that's really complicated, you know, like really severe disease, you know, you're suspected to require multiple interventions. Do you ever do just like a pre procedure, you know, arteriogram planning, like transradio or something like that, just do an aortogram with runoff just to see, the, get a lay of the land? Uh, really haven't. Um, you know, I, it's, it's always in the back of my mind as a possibility. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I get so excited, you know, I, I, I get in there and I see it and I'm like, all right, let's, you know, yeah, get me ABC, XYZ, prep the foot. We're coming up, we're coming down where this is the plan. And, and, uh, you know, it's, it's too much fun. Yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> and are you, are you doing, are you treating aorioliac disease as well? Uh, you know, in what, yeah. So aortic, not so much, but I mean, yeah, if we, I mean, we have common iliac occlusions, um, yeah. you know, that, that we are treating, uh, you know, it's, it's obviously, you know, it's, it's, if you haven't done a lot of them, uh, then you haven't seen a lot of bad things, but it's seriously, there's, there's serious risks of complications and they're not uncommon, uh, yeah. when you're recanalizing iliacs. Um, so, you know, I, I have, you know, a couple of good cases where there's some, uh, some, iliac explosions. Um, but you know, it's very clear and the techs all know and the nurses all know, and, and everybody kind of knows, uh, you know, if I say, all right, we got an included iliac, you know, this is the plan we have. Um, we actually have a, a really cool algorithm, um, which is as follows. Uh, we're always use a seven French sheath. We always use a super stiff, uh, 260 centimeter, uh, amplats. Uh, and then we do our, uh, do our, our, a small predilation check, uh, and then we'll do our, um, you know, stenting or whatever our, uh, um, you know, kind of final treatment is going to be. And then we, you know, do another run again immediately. So if there is a rupture in the iliac, we already have a seven French sheath and we already have a super stiff amplats up and over. 
Mm-hmm. So that means we can take the sheath out, we can bear back a fluency or whatever, you know, up to a nine French device, we're ready to go in. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, you know, just as long as you put the balloon up, you have time to get all this stuff ready. But, you know, we have it all lined up against the wall. We know what we have, we know what we might need. Um, the sheath comes out, we'll bear back the fluency in, we'll blow it up, um, seal the leak, put the seven French sheath back in, and then we're good. So if, you know, God forbid something were to happen, I've had, I've had two of these kind of iliac explosions over the last three years. Um, it's, it's very smooth, very yeah. easy. Um, and then, you know, we're, we're all prepared for it. And, um, along the same lines, uh, in terms of interprocedure, what are you guys doing for anesthesia in the OBL? I'll start with you, Omar. For anesthesia, I mean, we just use Versed and fentanyl. Like we have, you know, just IV sedation. Um, and um, we try not to do the case over two, three hours. You know, even, even if it's complicated, you know, we try to limit it. But that's kind of what we've been doing. And that's been working for us. A lot of these uh, procedures are, you know, infraringlinol. And, you know, they're, they're just like doing like a fistula gram or declot for the most part. You know what I mean? Like in these yeah. OBLs. So that, yeah. we kind of try to keep it like that. So. We do, we do some iliac stuff as well, like how Mike was saying, and we have everything ready, like covered stents and things like that. Like we even have like the balloon expandable, uh, like via, like the VBXs and ICAS, just, you know, if we think it's going to be like, you know, something that may rupture, we have that ready too. But I mean, usually, but usually all the stuff we're doing, the patients tolerate pretty well with just conscious sedation. I was going to say, we're, we're the same. I mean, um, you know, we're, we're rarely going over uh, two milligrams of Versed and 100 of fentanyl unless it does get prolonged. Um, and, you know, some people may need a little bit more. Uh, you know, we're, we're happy to give Benadryl, um, which I think really does kind of help. Um, but really, you know, we don't have any an, uh, anesthesiologist or, or, you know. CRNAs or anything like that. CRNA. And, you know, it, there, there's so much to get into when we talk about this stuff. But um, state by state varies as far as OBLs and, and ASCs and what you can do. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of it does have to do with sedation. So, yeah. you know, our ASCs are class Pennsylvania Class B ASCs, which means we can basically use fentanyl and Versed. Um, you know, we can't kind of go above that. Um, and you know, we don't, we don't find a need to just like Omar said it there, you know, it's once you, uh, you know, kind of numb the groin and, and, and get a sheath in, you know, a lot of times, you know, if you're, if you're ballooning a, a 25 centimeter SFA occlusion, um, you know, you, you, you may get an upset patient for a little while. Yeah. Um, but, but for the most part, you don't really need to go above and beyond that. We don't need people, you know, saying, staying like completely super still all the time. People are kicking and moving around. And, yeah. You know, we, we deal with it. <laughs> yeah. And, and if the patient's a big pain in the ass, I'll, I'll send him to the hospital. You know, <laughs> like, I mean, I kind of, if, if it's going to be a problem, I'll be like, man, you know, or I'll do, you know, I, I can kind of, or I'll do pedal or something like that. You know, just Tammy, like just from the foot, make it a little easier. Sometimes I do that. If they're like really complicated, like really obese or like really pain sensitive or something. Right. I've done that before too. Yeah, you, know, but, you know, it's going to be a longer case. That's actually a good trick. Um, you know, we, we, we try not to do people who are, you know, obviously unstable or, or, or have a lot of comorbidities, but you know, these are sick patients. So, you know, if you have someone who has trouble laying flat or someone trouble breathing, you can even sit them up basically, um, you know, and, and, and do like, you know, raise their, their, uh, upper body 30 degrees or so and do everything Tammy style just from the foot. Um, and that actually means they don't have to lay flat pretty much at all during the procedure. So that is, that is a good trick to kind of get around some of these, um, these comorbidities, some of these breathing issues. And so when you guys have a, a more complicated, do you guys have partnerships with vascular surgery? Um, you know, if you, let's say it's somebody who you think needs a bypass or you're kind of, um, you know, you, you've done all you can do in the OBL. What, what kind of relationships do you have with vascular surgery? Uh, you may go first or yeah, or, sure. Or, sure. Okay. okay. Um, yeah. So we have, um, you know, like, so these OBLs I work at, um, I probably work with probably four or five vascular surgeons. So sometimes I'll send them stuff. Sometimes they'll send me stuff. We have a pretty yeah. good relationship. I even, so we even have a transfer agreement with one of the hospitals. Like, so, um, if it's like a really big complication, and it's too far to go to PIH or something, I can send it to that hospital and work okay. with that vascular surgeon. So, I mean, you know, yeah, you got to have those things in place if, in the OBL. You got to have like a transfer agreement or have some privileges at nearby hospitals yeah. and have a good uh, relationship with these vascular surgeons that, um, yeah. yeah, I think that's a, that's a, always a good idea. But 
Um, yeah, so I, I work closely with uh, like about four or five vascular surgeons in the two OBLs that I work at. Well, yeah, the the, the transfer agreement is a requirement for any of these um, uh, any of these centers. Um, you know, it needs to be in place and it's, it's part of the department of health, you know, inspection. Let me see your transfer agreement and make sure that, you know, everything's safe for the patient. Um, so we, uh, you know, I, I guess our group at this point, it kind of waxes and wanes a little bit. Um, but we are three IRs and two vascular surgeons. Uh, so we actually employ vascular surgeons. Um, and, uh, you know, they basically, the, the model is, you know, they have a hospital practice, uh, and then, um, they have their own office, uh, to see patients. And then they will either, you know, do their patients from their office at their, you know, at the hospital, or they'll come to our center and do it there. Um, you know, they, they obviously do better financially when they bring patients to the, to the center. Um, and, you know, we benefit from that as well. And we have someone basically built in uh, to send the patient to whether, you know, patients show up with cold legs and say, look, you know, I'd, <laughs> I'd love to treat you, but, you know, you, you need to go to the hospital. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we have a guy who's going to who's there. He'll, you know, start the lysis and he'll he'll he'll, you know, see, t- you know, see you tomorrow as far as, you know, when he gets you open, do you need to you know get a bypass or, um, you know, whatever the case is. So we have um, those guys are located geographically where they're close enough to all of our centers that we can get people to pretty quickly. You know, the other, the other issue is when you're completely independent, you know, you may do, um, you know, a thousand cases and have basically zero complications. You have one groin complication. Uh, the patient has to go to the hospital, then, you know, whatever hospital they go to, whatever hospital system they, they, they end up at, you know, there's a, a high likelihood that they're going to bad mouth you pretty strongly. Right. Um, you know, what are these guys doing outside the hospital? Why are they doing this? This isn't right. This isn't safe, which is completely not true. I mean, all of the, uh, all of the actual published data that shows doing PAD and dialysis and outpatient centers has better safety outcomes, fewer complications. Um, and then, you know, we know how to manage them appropriately, but you know, you can have someone in a hospital who does a hundred of these procedures and has 10 bad complications. We all know those people. Um, but that doesn't make it out. That doesn't become, you know, a, a talking point for every other specialist in the community, because right. that all just kind of gets covered in the hospital. Um, you know, the patient goes from, you know, or patients in an OR somewhere are getting a procedure done. The iliac gets ruptured, the patient or the, 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 the doc can't handle it flips out and they call in the vascular surgeon to come in and rescue them right then and there. The patient leaves the OR, nobody knows anything about it. So, you know, you, you do have to have, I guess, allies, yeah. um, <laughs> or someone who's part of the group or someone that you have a really good referral relationship with um, that's not antagonistic towards you. So Mike, when you first started, you say you didn't have those hospital privileges. Correct. Me, you had this kind of setup with, with the hospital where it was um, if you had such an issue, you could call somebody up at the hospital and say, Hey man, I, I had a growing complication or something like that. Absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah that, that's, that's always been, you know, I, I've never, you know, been in a situation where I felt, you know, the patient was unsafe or, or yeah. I, or I didn't have the backup that I needed. Yeah. Um, it, it's just, you know, there are, it's, it's so easy to do this stuff safely and have the safeguards in place. There's no reason not to. Um, and you know, there are, it's, there, there are kind of bad actors in this game too, um, you know, we know of other, you know, offices around town where bad things happen and, and people are doing things where, you know, they probably shouldn't, they're not, they don't have the oversight they really should. Uh, and maybe they are practicing a little bit outside of their scope. And, um, you know, we know it happens, uh, yeah. but, but the, 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 you have to do it right, you know, in order to do the right thing for the patients and, and make sure that your business is going to survive, make sure you're going to be able to do what you want to do long-term. Yeah. Um, all right, guys. Well, I want to get into equipment a little bit and find out from you guys, um, you know, specifically, are you guys using our atherectomy devices and are there any devices that are particularly good in the outpatient setting that maybe you didn't have a chance to use in the hospital for, for whatever reason? Yeah. Um, so I guess to survive in the OBL, atherectomy is a must, you know, I think <laughs> just for the reimbursement aspect of it. Um, yeah. um, so yeah, we have, uh, at my OBL, so I, one of them, I think we just have CSI, which is fine uh, for the most part. And the other one, I have uh, Phoenix. There's uh, my boy. 
Thanks to Mike. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, I, I saw I saw Mike's cases. I was like, oh man, I gotta have Phoenix. But for some reason, I'm not getting those outcomes. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Anyways, uh, whatever. Uh, so I have Phoenix and I have CSI and I have Jetstream, uh, which is like a Boston. Uh, I have I have those three atherectomy devices at the other OBL. Hmm. And um, we have all types of balloons, 014 wires, 014 balloons, 018 balloons and catheters. I mean, we have aspiration devices. So we have everything. I, I think we're better equipped than some hospitals. And we've, we have IVIS now, which, you know, I didn't have at first, but I've got IVIS, which is uh, also very, like, is, all, is, a, is a must to have. Um, but um, For PAD? Yeah, for PAD yeah, and for venous. I use it for PAD and venous yeah. disease, yeah. Mm-hmm. So I've heard mixed... Um, Opinions on, uh, you know, IVIS being essential for PD. What, why do you think that it's a must? Just um, you know, there have been lesions that don't look so bad on the angio. And then we IVIS it and, you know, you see like a pretty bad uh, stenosis or you'll see a dissection that you may have missed that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think for those reasons, or, you know, just to size the vessel appropriately to stent it. Yeah. I've seen so many undersized stents, uh, you know. Uh, yeah. on for that that was done somewhere else where whoever stented it you know if they had ivis or something they probably could have sized it better you know what i mean so yeah. i don't know just for those reasons I, I i can think of so are you using the ivis um like at the beginning of the the procedure to determine the degree of stenosis and also it right before the intervention or after the intervention yeah usually uh, uh, before and sometimes after, like if I'm really happy, I uh, may not need, you know, if it looks beautiful, then yeah. I may not do it. But if there's any question, I'll probably check it, you know, to see gotcha. if there's anything else need, I need to tack up or stent or anything like that. Um, yeah, like Omar mentioned, I mean, atherectomy certainly, you know, if, if, a, if a device costs you somewhere between one and $2,000 and the reimbursement goes up five or $6,000 for doing it, it obviously makes sense financially. Um, you know, I, I do also believe in it as a treatment. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not the kind of guy who, you know, lays an atherectomy device over top of the patient and takes a picture of it and says, I did it. Um, cause I, I do believe, um, you know, all the devices have their pros and their cons. And I, you know, we have such a, uh, that was a joke by the way about the, <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, we, we have such, such high volume, um, that, you know, we really have access to all the toys, yeah. So, um, you know, when I first started, uh, we, the choices were Jetstream, uh, or Rotoblader from Boston Scientific, CSI. Um, we had the Phoenix, which is Volcano at that point. Um, we then, uh, we also had the Silver and Turbo Hawk. We've since added the Laser. And now at one of our centers, we have Pantheris. So basically, we, we play with all of them. Um, and I, I have, you know, pretty strong feelings uh, about some of them, uh, and I can talk about that a little bit. But Ivis, I think, is essential. Um, anybody who says anything bad about Ivis, I think, isn't using it appropriately. Uh, every patient gets Ivis. Um, we have so, you know, the economics of it again work work because the Ivis catheter, depending on how many you buy or who which one you use, just say it, it costs less than a thousand dollars. But reimbursement is, um, you know, somewhere about thirteen or fourteen hundred dollars for the first vessel, and then three hundred for the next two segments. So you know, it's it you do make money doing it, but um, you know, which is why it's kind of being pushed for the the OBL. But I mean, I think it's absolutely essential. Like I said, everybody gets it. Uh, what I tend to do is, since the IVIS we use is O one four, and that the atherectomy devices we tend to use are O one four. I will do my runoff of the. Uh, of the um, leg, I will cross whatever lesion it is or get myself in position that I think I'm about to treat. And then I will run the IVIS over it. <clears throat> so that will show me on the screen exactly where the lesion really, really starts. Sometimes it's a centimeter more distal than you think. Mm. Um, it'll show you, you know, where, where the lesion ends. It'll show you, like Omar said, what the size is, what the plaque looks like. Sometimes you'll, you'll go through it and say, wow, this stuff, the density of this stuff is weird. This might be some really soft stuff. I'm not sure I want to, you know, really mess with it. Or you can see it's like super calcified or it's, you know, whether it's um, medial calcification or whether there's big calcified rocks. Um, it really can change how you treat things and, and what you do. So I, I think it's, it's extremely important. Um, you know, the, the kind of jokes we made about the Phoenix, 
um, I, I use this device, um, you know, almost all the time. Uh, and, and I think it's in my, in my case, uh, I think it's the safest. Um, I, I have not had any, you know, in, in, in using it, you know, well over a thousand times, I've not had any downstream embolization. Uh, it is a front cutting device that basically through Archimedes screw technology pulls the, uh, pulls the, the, whatever you're cutting, whether it's, uh, Neo Intima or plaque or calcium pulls it back in through the housing and really doesn't send it downstream at all. And since it's center cutting, it doesn't, um, it doesn't, uh, cause any intimal or medial damage, uh, which I think leads to restenosis pretty quickly. It can cut through calcium. It can, it can do a lot of things. Um, but you know, the, the laser also has its place, obviously for ISR and for stuff that may have some acute thrombus, the, the laser has, you know, can help there. Um, I think jet stream is great for like, um, really heavy calcifications. I think it's shown that it can do a really good job. Um, CSI and occluded tibials that I can't get anything else down does a good job. So everything has a, has kind of like a, a niche for me. We use, uh, drug, uh, looting stents and we use drug coated balloons. Um, the, the, the economics of that is not wonderful. Um, but really I think in a lot of cases, uh, any recent meta-analysis notwithstanding at the moment, it's the right thing to do for the patients in a lot of cases. Okay. Um, so, you know, we, we have, and again, we have, we have a volume, um, that, you know, all the device companies are, are happy to make deals with us. Mm-hmm. So we, we're not, we're not paying, you know, full price for any of this stuff. Gotcha. Um, Omar, what about you? Are you using drug-coated balloons? Fairly often? Uh, I don't use the drug-coated balloons, but I have, I do have, I have used drug, uh, uh, um, eluding stents. Uh, okay. um, you know, we recently did a, uh, what's that Boston stent that came out? Illuvia. We recently did that this week and we've been using silver PTX before that. But uh, yeah, I use it sometimes because it's kind of costly in the OBL, but uh, sometimes in a patient that has like a long occlusion or something, I'll probably want to treat with a, you know, or just dep- depending on the lesion, I, sometimes that like Mike, I'll treat with a drug eluding stent. Yeah, I think, I think young, I think young patients or patients who have, you know, a stent that continues to restenose and you can't kind of get it back and you don't want to reline it with another bare metal. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, there, there's this. There's just some, sometimes I think that it's, you know, definitely the right thing to do. And, and, you know, my use of drug eluding stents is actually extremely high. Um, you know, I, I, I find it, I find it difficult to put bare metal stents in people, um, you know, with, with a difference in patency. Um, but, you know, obviously with any, any evolving, uh, data and research, we got to, you know, keep our eyes open and be ready to pivot, but that's kind of what I do now. Are you guys using uh, CO2 at all in your labs? Um, we have it. I, I don't use it much, but like, yeah, and some of the patients with, uh, you know, uh, that are not on dialysis yet, but, are, you know, yeah, are, you know have like low GFR, we've used it. I use that, um, what's that device? Uh, the, com- the Commander. The Commander, yeah. So we have that. It's really, it's really convenient and easy to use CO2. I don't have like a big pump or something like that. You know, we have that little device, handheld device, so. Yeah, we, we use the, we use this, the the commander. I think it's wonderful, but we actually have a, a, a very high population of um, renal transplant patients. Mm-hmm. Um, so one of our referrers is a vascular surgeon who's a transplant surgeon, and he sends us all of his patients with PAD. And you know, we we see sometimes you know four or five renal transplants um, a week. Um, you know, and then we have a lot of people who are on the verge of dialysis. So I wouldn't be surprised to say that. Um, you know, maybe 20 or 25 percent of our patients are, are co2 oh, wow. you know may, maybe maybe only a fraction of that are only co2 but you know what we'll do is um you know gfr well what i'll do gfr above 60 i don't care about it um unless they have a renal transplant then they're getting co2 um gfr is 45 to 60 i'll use um i'll use visipake basically i don't know if that actually helps but i like to think it does and then below 45, they get some combination of CO2. And as it gets lower, you know, less and less to no contrast, um, you know, down below 30, I'm not using contrast, but you, know, you can do pretty well if you're not, you know, trying to reconstitute a PETA loop. I'll do CO2 for, you know, to do the, um, the iliacs and lower aorta and then oh, gotcha. SFA trifurcation. And then, you know, there are some times that, you know, if, if it looks like, you know, the, the tibials are, 
mostly open or, you know, have, you know, focal lesion somewhere, um, you know, I'll get a, I'll get a, uh, soft atraumatic 014 wire and put it down each tibial and Ivis them. Mm. Um, so, you, you know, you can use Ivis for that as well. Um, but you know, if there's someone who, you know, I, I really, really, you know, so, so you get some of these people who have renal transplants that they've had for, you know, 17 years and their GFR is, you know, 48, you know, I, and they have some non-healing wound. I'm saying, look, I'm, I'm going to do everything I can to not use any contrast whatsoever. And, and yeah. you got to kind of pull out all the stops. Okay. And, uh, for closure, what are you guys using for closure devices? Um, I like to use per close for contralateral, uh, access. Uh, and then for anagrade, I've been using minx, which I, I like more than, I mean, I, I know a lot of people use Angiosil, but I, I, I see, I've seen a lot of complications with Angiosil, so I've, <laughs> I've used these other two devices. <laughs> what about you, Mike? <laughs> yeah. So uh, when I first started, I was using, um, I was using Angiosil. Uh, and I was one of those guys who had a lot of complications. I mean, we're seeing a lot of bad people as far as, um, you know, calcified common femorals. Sometimes, you know, we get people from all over the place, you know, referred to us as, as, you know, kind of second opinions and they have, uh, common femoral stents and, you know, the, which I'm, um, you know, I can't say I've never put a common femoral stent in, but, you know, you see a lot of them and you, you don't want to close them because, you know, I think what happens with the angio seal, um, is if you can't get a, a perfect uh, effacement kind of of that foot plate against the anterior wall, you end up pushing some of that collagen or whatever that matrix is directly into the artery and shutting down that leg. Yeah. So I had I had a lot of issues with that early on. I tried to start using um, perclose and, you know, same thing. If you have calcified uh, artery and those needles don't fire, you're kind of stuck. Um, so I went to star close, which my uh, Abbott rep would – even though he was selling it would call star open, um, which I thought was cute, uh, because it did, it did seem like it was just like, you know, a lot of times just throwing a, a, a piece of night in there and having the tech hold pressure for a half hour. Um, but you know, I, I've been lucky that, um, you know, my partner also owns a medical device company. So, um, you know, he's developed, uh, a, a closure device, um, which really isn't, mass marketed but it's fda approved um and i use it and i love it um huh. it's uh you know i've i've i think i've i've talked about it on on my twitter feed and um i also presented some data on the large board version in viva this year it's called the closer it's simple enough from rex medical um <clears throat> it's uh it's basically an absorbable patch uh that that just sandwiches the arteriotomy inside and outside um, quick, simple, easy. Um, I think it's a great device, but uh, since then I've been using it for, it's been almost two years. It's just changed. It's been a game changer for me. Use that on every case. pretty much. <clears throat> I use it on basically every case. Yeah. Um, I almost never, uh, use anything else. Uh, it's actually, it's a, it's a seven French device. Um, so I guess theoretically, if I've had to go larger for something, which is almost never, um, I'll use an eight French angio seal with, with, uh, with bated breath, I guess. All right. Well, uh, so the other thing I wanted to talk to you guys about was, um, endpoints. And, um, this is something that we talked about a little bit with Kumar Matisseri and, and Sabine on a prior podcast and sort of what their endpoints were, um, you know, what they were trying to, to accomplish, especially in the more complicated, you know, below the knee type of cases, uh, so I was wondering if you guys could comment on, on, you know, what, like when you, when do you know, you know, sure. to walk away? Uh, I, I guess, you know, I think my, <laughs> I've kind of, I guess, evolved a little bit over the past three years. And and so um, my end point now, um, you know, if at all possible, it's, um, you know, it, it's the pedal loop. Um, and I think it's, that ends up being key to really healing wounds and, and treating CLI patients. Um, I will work very hard to kind of re, to try to reconstitute it. And if I, if I see any path, you know, I will, I will work hard to get it open and I'll, I'll balloon it. Um, and if there's any communication between the PT at the ankle and the DP at the top of the foot, you know, I, I think, um, you know, these guys are going to do really, really well. Uh, I say I've evolved a little bit because up till you know, maybe six months ago, um, I wanted a wound blush, which I still love. I mean, I'm still, I still think that's a great, um, endpoint, 
Um, but I really, really wanted to see a direct line to a blush at the wound, which I still think is, you know, the, the best thing you can do for someone if you if you can't kind of get, I, mean, I don't want to say kind of collateral flow. It's not what I mean, but flow from both of the the posterior and the anterior um, coming down to one point through that loop. Um, getting a direct line to the blush is fine. And when I started, it was much more, you know, kind of angiosomal. Um, mm-hmm. And it was just like, all right, well, this should be, you know, in the AT territory. Let me open up the AT and see what happens. And I think I've probably continued to see better outcomes as I've evolved a little bit. Um, but, you know, my, my primary goal is, is that loop. Um, and if not, then it's, you know, the direct, direct wound blush. Cool. Omar? Yeah, uh, for me, I, I'll just take what I can get. Um, you know, uh, my goal is at least get straight line flow to the foot, you know, uh, where it can perfuse that wound kind of like, uh, what Mike is saying, then pedal loops, you know, I'll do, I'll try to do that. It's just still pretty challenging for me, uh, at my, Mm -hmm. at my level. Um, I've, you know, doing that, I have to be sure like this patient is going to get a BK because the worst thing I want to do is try to do a pedal loop and mess it up more, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of a little more conservative in that sense. Um, where, uh, you know, it, it just depends on how sick the patient is and what I can get away with. So I try to be as conservative as possible and then, you know, see how he does and bring him back and be more aggressive if the wound doesn't heal. But yeah, I mean, what, my, what Mike is saying is right. That should be the end point, you know, it's just, but it also depends on your expertise. You know, I think the, at least for me, uh, doing the, the, the those pedal loops and stuff, it can be pretty tough. It still is for me, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, well, great guys. I, I mean, we cover a lot of great stuff here and I kind of want to finish it up with asking you guys, since I think that, you know, with this whole IR residency, we're going to, we're going to have a lot more young IRs coming out with more of a clinical uh, background, wanting to, to go out and have their own clinics and, and probably, probably delve into PAD. And, and I know that, you know, I'm, I'm in, within the last five years of, of graduating and, uh, you know, do you guys, can you think of any good resources for young IRs or people coming out of fellowship who, who either want to get in the OBL setting, um, or, or want to get, and, or want to get into PAD? Hmm. Uh, you know, I, I like that, um, you know, um, OEIS, uh, society, you know, of outpatient endovascular, it's like multidisciplinary. Uh, yeah. that's a great, uh, that's a great thing to join. Um, and, um, they have all these like old presentations and things, oh, okay. and old meetings that teach a lot about like, you know, safety and how to market and open up the OBL. So that's a really good resource. Oh, all right. So you can access those on the, on the website, but yeah, yeah that, that's a great resource to join and to oh, learn okay. from. Yeah. yeah. And I guess yeah, that's did you go to their actually. conference? I have not yeah. been to their conference. Um, but that's something that would be, I think, valuable for, yeah. uh, for anybody doing OBL. Maybe I'll go in the future. It's just I'll wait for it to come closer to the West Coast, I guess. Yes, yeah, never in San Diego. Oh wait. <laughs> so, yeah, it needs to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll see. Uh but yeah, uh that's a great resource. Um I don't know. I I think, you know, uh SIR, I don't know, SIR has uh like that uh PAD stuff coming back. Yeah, we're trying to, we're trying to get the learn meeting back um, oh, nice. in in this this fall, maybe in October. That you know, stay stay tuned for that. That's um, something as part of the PAD service line we're we're working on getting back. It looks like it's going to happen. Cool. Um, that's that's aimed towards early career stuff. Um, sorry, Omar, I didn't mean to step on you. Yeah, and, yeah, and, and Mike, I want to say Twitter is a great resource. You know, for PAD, I think I, it honestly yeah. is. Yeah, I think so. So, yeah, just join Twitter. You know. <laughs> Learn, learn. From all these <laughs> follow, uh, follow, Kum- follow Kumar. Yeah, Kumar. Yeah, Kumar. Yeah. <laughs> um, so my my perspective on the question, you know, I'm 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 kind of a shill for multiple mul- multiple medical device companies, um, but you know, I I do really think that they have a tremendous interest in getting young uh, physicians, whether they be trainees or early career people, uh, involved in using their devices um, and. I think that specifically in a lot of cases means using them in outpatient settings. So, you know, whether it be Phillips or Boston Scientific or Abbott, um, you know, they, you know, whoever it is, Medtronic, they all, CSI, they all have these programs um, 
they call fellows programs or, you know, early career programs. And they will, they will basically, if you go to your local rep or you go to the website and say, Hey, look, you know, I live wherever I'm looking to get into this, you know, can you hook me up with somebody, you know, a proctor or something? Um, Mm -hmm. every one of them will find, you know, a day or two that works for you. Um, they'll fly you to wherever they'll put you up in a hotel. The local rep there will take you out to dinner, bring you into the, the lab the next day and sit you down with somebody. I've done this, you know, a, a dozen times, um, where someone, you know, I meet somebody for dinner, they come in the next morning and then I talk them through my cases. And then between cases, I sit down and say, this is how we do it. This is what I've done. This is how we get patients. This is how we follow them up. Um, and then, you know, by the end of the day, it's like, all right, here's my cell phone number. And, uh, you know, any, anything you need, you know, this is, this is how it's done, you know, in, in my practice, there are a million ways to do it, but, you know, hopefully if you can see a way that works, um, and you know, you can, you can do this with multiple different places and and multiple different companies, uh, to, to really, you know, get some real world experience. I mean, you're not, you're not, your hands aren't on the wire, but I mean, as far as seeing how the patients get treated, I mean, when someone comes and says, I want to start doing some PAD and I say, all right, come, you know, next Thursday, and we do seven or eight PAD cases, um, you know, it, they see how the turnover works. They see how the, the nurses and techs work. They see, you know, basically everything. And it's, it's much more education than how to kind of do this and much more high volume PAD or CLI than you're going to see in a hospital right. uh, all packed into a day. So, you know, if there's a rep that you know or a company that you know that you like, that you trust, um, you know, ask. They'll hook you up with somebody. Well, thanks for thanks guys for coming on the show. Um, we learned a lot today, and uh, feel free to um, reach out to Backtable uh, via Twitter or via LinkedIn um, or email. You can email us at Aaron at Backtable dot com for any questions um, or any comments, or if you want to hear any any topics in the future. Thanks again, guys, for coming on the show. Thank you, Aaron. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot for having us.